Okay, good afternoon. Okay, we'll start. Uh, this is the second lecture in a series of six. Uh, we we'll just summarize a little bit what we saw uh, last time and uh, come to this subject. As you remember, we spoke of the uh, studio. And uh, in the with the theme I wanted to develop of the uh, representation of the indoor and the outdoor, um, the studio was a kind of ambivalent space. Uh, since at first you can see it as a very close area in which the artist likes to work and not to be disturbed by anybody and uh, will be like really uh, detaching himself from the exterior, if you want, from the outdoor. And on the other hand, as we saw, for instance, in the, the painting of uh, Basile, uh, the idea of the opening the studio to friends, uh, other painters, to even curators or, uh, or even collectors uh, makes sense also. Uh, that will be a place where not only uh, will not be closed, but will be open to the external world. And also in another sense that uh, you can bring in the studio sketches or, or image that you have done outside in order to create now a more finished painting. Uh, this was uh, very often uh, the case in, in, for the group of seven, for instance. Huh? Uh, they want to give you the impression that they were outdoor and it was very tough to do. But in fact, uh, I always imagined that the Jack Pine of, uh, of uh, Thompson or it was done from the the, uh, the gallery of uh, Dr. McCallum with a scotch nearby and, and they were just painting what, what was there. No, but uh, I caricature. They, they did these little sketches and then they had a, a very well organized studio in Toronto uh, where they make the big painting. And so you have this, uh, this possibility and that's why I was tempted to compare that to the um, Camera Obscura uh, in which you have a closed box in which the artist could be just with a little hole to get the things from outside inside. And this little hole was like uh, the sketches or whatever the, the artists bring in the studio. Okay. So a kind of ambivalent space uh, that could be seen as indoor, outdoor at the same time. With the domestic space that we will deal today, it seems much more simpler in the sense that uh, a domestic space, and especially if we define eventually also like a private space, should be closed. Uh, and you could define more or less this privacy like to be protected from any side from the others. Uh, uh, that's why that when we are home without witness, uh, we lose some good manners. Uh, we do things that we will not dare to do outside. Uh, uh, sometimes it can be uh, not so uh, agreeable or funny. You remember this case of the terrible uh, uh, man that uh, kept his daughter for uh, years in a dungeon under the house and uh, rape her and, uh, and make her uh, the uh, mother of seven of his children. It was something awful, but this is again, this when you define privacy like completely closed from the exterior uh, in which you don't have any more this ambivalence that I was speaking about the studio, uh, you could see that it could go also to this extreme. But without going so far, I think a anybody uh, will have a temptation that if you hear from the other side of the wall, your neighbors discussing loudly and all that, you are tempted to intervene a little bit, but then you say, no, no, yeah, we should not do it. But this is again this kind of perception uh, of this very close area. Domestic come from domus, and uh, who means house. Uh, so it's, it's really this kind of uh, environment in which, for instance, the family will, will, uh, will express itself. And also with this idea of uh, sometimes uh, an area even more private in which uh, we are uh, protected from any looks from outside. To introduce my subject uh, today, I will present you two installation or video or installation of uh, contemporary artists, of, of artists who are still living today. Uh, I take a risk, no? I, it's, a, it's a kind of new stuff, not, uh, not easy to, to swallow, let's say. But both of them, I think, approach the theme of domestic uh, space in a kind of negative way, and then through the negation, 
make us realize what it is really. So, so, I don't know if it's, uh, it's not clear, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I will try to, to show you. The first one is this uh, video of which I showed you just one picture. Uh, done by a Toronto artist who's called Daniel Horson. And it's uh, the title of the video, it's Pepper's Ghost, uh, you will see why. What you see uh, when you look at the video, it's, it's suddenly it's a kind of a, a non-descript place, like it's, uh, maybe a, uh, it's a, a room or an office or something like that with, with a few uh, objects on, on the table. And then suddenly, uh, this ghost appeared there, somebody who is transparent, uh, you see through him uh, the whole furniture. And uh, he have, uh, a, a, I hope it's a pyjama, or, or maybe it's a prisoner <laughs> type of uh, outfit. He's without uh, shoes, and he holds something, a book or something in his hand, and he's, he's smiling, he seems to be uh, uh, able to communicate with us. And this immediately, of course, because we, we speak of ghosts, we had this feeling that uh, you have a, a very intimate type of space there. There's no windows, there's nothing. You, you are maybe in a basement or something. And then suddenly a ghost come in there. So it's a kind of an intrusion of something from exterior that come in the interior. And this reminds me a text by André Breton in Nadja, I don't know if you ever read Nadja, but it's a, it's a very strange type of uh, book in which uh, Breton uh, tells the story that he meet a, a girl on the street uh, who looks a little bit like a medium, and Breton is fascinated by this, uh, this kind of person. And uh, she has the, uh, the, the power, let's say, to predict. Uh, she says, for instance, look at this window there where it's dark, and suddenly you will see it would turn red, and then click, suddenly somebody opened the light and you see the red curtain and all that. So Nadja is a kind of medium. And in the beginning of the novel, the uh, Breton uh, refer to a saying that in French uh, sound like this, dis-moi qui tu hantes, je te dirai qui tu es. Huh? Tell me who you haunt, and I will tell you who you are. And he says this, uh, this uh, saying is bizarre because to know really what I am, I have to perceive me as a ghost, in a way. Huh? Because to haunt, normally it's an haunted house, or it's, a, it's as if you were already dead, but you will still exist in the memory of people, of people that used to like you, but then it will be a very different definition of yourself than the one you will have if you are still alive. Huh? So that's why he says, this is a very curious uh, saying that uh, when I, I will be a specter, right, when I will be a ghost, I will finally know uh, what really I am. Uh, meaning that then I will be defined by all the relationship that I had with other people and, and hopefully by people who, who, who used to like me, well, mind you, you could be also uh, remember as a very nasty man and for forever by, uh, by <laughs> so may, may, you will be defined. Huh? You will have suddenly a definition. So he play a little, a little bit on this because the man who is in the video here is Daniel Olson himself. Huh? So the problem then, yeah, there's a technical problem. How can he do, uh, how can he transform himself in a ghost like this? And this, in fact, he used uh, a famous I would say, uh, illusionist trick uh, that was adapted to the theater by Monsieur Pepper. And that's why it's called Pepper Ghost. Uh. So what it was, so you, you have a real actor, let's say, in the bottom of the scene on which you project a uh, bright light. And then on the scene, you have a glass. And the glass is, uh, let's say, at 45 uh, degree uh, uh, angle. So the reflection of the man under the, the stage will be seen on the glass, but for the spectator in the, in the, like you in the hall, 
they will have the impression to see a ghost. And he's there with a, with a knife and a, with, with a sword trying to, to kill the ghost. And of course, it's just a, an illusion and nothing happened. This was very good for Hamlet, for instance. When, when you, you play Hamlet, you need this device because there's a ghost in Hamlet. As you know, he's the father of, the, of Hamlet coming to tell him that he have to revenge him and all that. So it, it, was, uh, it was used in theater, but it was used also for magic trick and things like that. So that's why he called it uh, Olsen call his, his video the Olsen ghost. But here you have a kind of definition of the interior space as something that could be intruded. And that's why I says it's a definition of the inside space, but negatively, by, by a negation of what it is. Uh, normally, we should not have ghosts in our room. Uh, they, they should be kept out. And uh, so if they intrude, that means a kind of negative definition uh, of the space. The other work, in which you see a little bit of the same idea, and also very different. Here it's a, not a video, it's an, what we call an installation, and that uh, habitually the public don't like. It says, what is this, what is doing in a museum? We, we used to have painting, we have to have sculpture, we have to have this type of structure. This is huge, right? It's a, it, is, it occupied a whole space of a, of a room in the Musée d'Art Contemporain in uh, 2006, so it's a very, Samuel Roybois is a French-Canadian uh, Quebecois artist, but live in Vancouver. Uh, I don't know much about him. I know that he was in Concordia, like uh, any good student in art should be. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, before he was at Laval University, but well, okay, he finished in Concordia, like it. Well, and, um, uh, and he lived in Vancouver. But he made th this exhibition was called uh, Ridiculous and Improbable. And that was the title of the exhibition. And you have installation like this. So this, at first sight, what you see is a kind of room in which we would have cut all the walls and we will reveal this kind of foam that we put uh, for isolation inside of the house and, and all this structure in wood. And uh, when you look more closely to it, you realize that inside of this box, there's only the room for one bed and there's no space around. And, uh, and nothing also in the room except the bed. It is as if this interior space, the domestic space, was suddenly reduced to uh, just a bed, uh, to the essential, <laughs> if you want, and also open to every, uh, everybody to, to look at. Uh, you could even sleep there if you want, uh, in the museum. I was not courageous enough to do it. Uh, but I, you could see that people were entering in it and, and having a little nap. Uh, uh, okay, then again, you have a, ne a, a negative definition of the domestic space, uh, as if you, you uh, create, uh, you, you make feel what it is by intruding in it, by breaking it in a certain way, like th there, by removing the walls and reducing it just to the bed. This, if you go back a little bit in time, you will see that you have this type of feeling in other uh, medium. Like in this photography of Eugène Adguet, uh, you, you know that he is a famous photographer of, of the very beginning of photography, and he make a specialty of photographing the street of Paris and the little places like that. And he went uh, from room to room like this, photographing again, a little space, uh, all crammed like this. So you have only a side uh, bed, a table, a little carpet, but for the rest, it's almost like in the uh, Samuel Roibois uh, installation that I showed you just before. Right? You have this crowded space. And then by uh, pure hazard, I was working on a very different thing. I saw suddenly that you could have the same idea in an illumination of the, uh, now we're in the 15th century, it's the, uh, the Richer of the Duc de Berry, it's a beautiful uh, illumination book, in which you see, uh, it's a, they want to show the nativity, of course, and uh, they want to show the, this kind of barn in which uh, Jesus was born. So you have only two walls uh, that are uh, depicted, and almost not much more room than for a bed also, well, they, there is the, the, the bull and the ass who have their place there. 
But it's St. Joseph who have no place at all. Huh? You see, he put just a, feet, a foot inside. He come with a diaper, for God's sake. Give him, give him a space. And, and, and he have just a foot there. He have no space to do it. So it's the same, a little bit the same idea uh, of this. Then I, I ask myself, okay, what is, uh, especially if you go to uh, Canadian art in the very beginning, in the in New France period, they will be interested in subject of religious, subject of that nature, and especially of the theme of the so-called Olay family. Uh, this was instituted very early here by Monseigneur Laval. He wanted to have a confrérie de la Sainte Famille, alors, uh, where, uh, to encourage all the family to, to, have, uh, to, to, to behave nice, uh, as they should, as good Catholic and all that. And, and uh, he created this uh, organization. Uh, and what, what I was asking myself, okay, how they show the Ole family, which kind of model they give. And uh, at first, you, we, we could think something of that nature. Say we are used to this uh, kind of depiction of the Ole family with Joseph as a carpenter and Mary uh, just being very proud of this fantastic child uh, who have rays on his head and all that. Edward Stott is not a Canadian painter, he's an English painter uh, that studied in France uh, with uh, Cabanel and was influenced uh, by Millet and by people of that period. And uh, he lived in England and especially in the country and he wanted to be like, uh, uh, to, to document a little bit what happened in the country. So it, here we are not really in the house, we are in a kind of uh, shop huh? and very open. As you can see in the door, you have uh, um, uh, sheep uh, who can enter there. On the floor you have these uh, shavings of, of, of wood. And uh, so he stop a little bit his, his work to look at the child. This is in fact a very recent representation of the Ole family. Huh? Even if it looks very familiar, the, it is in fact not in the tradition. You will see that the tradition was very different. But to show one example of a Canadian painter who was in this recent uh, tradition, I show you here um, a, a painting by Ozias Le Duc, who is in the Joliet Cathedral. And it's one of the first work that he did really uh, at this scale, you see, in which he, he illustrates all the church, all the, the, the painting there. Uh, he was a young man there, and I'm, I'm sure that he inspired himself of some uh, engravings or some uh, painting before him, because it's not very original. Uh. What you see on the right, it is a sketch preparatory for the painting, in which you have some difference with the finished painting. Uh, the, especially, uh, Joseph doesn't seem to, to do the same thing in the two uh, picture. But uh, for the rest, uh, Jesus is there playing with, with piece of wood and suddenly discovered a cross. Uh, so it's a little bit, uh, I, I, use, I wanted to say morbid, but uh, it's not the right word, I'm sure. Uh, because suddenly uh, you have this cross uh, theme. And of course, Mary is suing. Uh, this is a typical, this is what we, uh, in this kind of very classical type of representation, women do. Uh, they, they, they just repair endlessly clothes and more. And okay, so, so this is, I guess, it, it's tardive. Huh? It's not, it's not the, the real old uh, interpretation of it. You will see then, if we go back in, in, in the past, and, and always with, with Canadian example, here you have a, a, a very interesting painting by Frère Luc. Frère Luc is a, a Ricolet. The Ricolet were kind of Franciscan uh, fathers. Uh, they don't exist anymore, but they, they were part of the Franciscan order. And uh, they came here in Canada about the same time like the Jesuit with the same idea of converting all the Indians they could. And uh, finally the Jesuit took over and they were uh, more active, let's say, uh, more uh, fixed to, to town and, and less uh, mi uh, missionary. But anyway, uh, so this Frère Luc was a Frenchman that came here in 1670, 1671. He was here for 15 months. And he succeeded to make few paintings that were distributed or in the churches or in the monastery. Like here, this painting is in the monastery of the Ursuline de Quebec. Uh, and what it represents is the Ole family, again, with a, a girl who is in fact a Huron girl. You, you will notice at her belt, she have a little medal there uh, that indicate that she's a, a converted 
Huh? Well, this is kind of a difficult type of situation, a difficult type of business. The Ursuline, like they, they, I'm sure they were well-intentioned and they wanted the, the salvation of all these uh, savages and these barbars, <laughs> whatever they called them at the time. But uh, in fact, they were taking these young people from their family, bringing them in Quebec in a seminary where they were uh, cut from, from any contact with the family. And uh, when the public, for instance, the, uh, the memoir of the Ursuline are published, huh? and if you read this, you don't have the impression that n anybody is really unhappy there. They quote, for instance, some girls who says, I'm very happy to be with you mothers because I, I don't want to go back to my family in the woods and in the snow. Okay, but, but nevertheless, it's your father and mother. Huh? And we know for sure that for many of these kids, it was a very difficult situation. Huh? And you know that today there's a kind of reclamation of, uh, against the church about that. The idea was to remove them from the nomadic uh, parents and to stabilize them in order that they will learn the catechism, for, for, for God's sake. Huh? Uh, that was the, the idea of this. But uh, it, it was a kind of cruelty. So what happened here, it is that the only family who is a little bit partly spi uh, uh, like spirits a little bit, huh? like ancestors, let's say, for these Indian kids, they could imagine them as part of the family that they have been cut from. Huh? And that's what, what more or less uh, the, the, the painting of, uh, of Frère Luc felt. In fact, he was illustrating a dream by Marie de l'Incarnation, and Marie de l'Incarnation is a fantastic dreamer. Huh? She, she wrote her, her memoir, and she, have, she, she take notes of oral dream. And she dreamed, for instance, that St. Joseph presented a little Huron girls to the, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary to, uh, as a kind of a, a beginning of evangelization, let's say, of the Indians. Huh? So, and Marie de l'Incarnation was, was married and was the mother of, of, of a boy before entering in the orders. Huh? So she, she had a kind of maternal instinct, and I guess she felt the problem of these little girls that they need a kind of surrogate family, uh, uh, maybe uh, completely imaginary, but since in their culture they relate to ancestors, they relate to this kind of extended family, it could make sense that the only family could play that role. Uh. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing to notice, it is the kind of surrounding in which this Ole family is presented. You have a curtain, a red curtain, and then it seems open completely on the exterior. Uh, the only furniture is a kind of throne or, or a, if you're an armchair on which the, the Virgin is sitting. But for the rest, you see the, the rock of Quebec in the, in the background, and you see really as if you were almost outside. Uh. And then I, I ask myself, is it, is it typical of this older iconography to show the Ole family without this kind of domestic type of uh, surrounding? Uh, and here you will see another example of that. If you have followed my lectures since a long time, you will remember this, this painting, which is uh, really amazing. It's also at the Ursuline uh, de Quebec, it's a huge painting that represents, in fact, the uh, uh, Han of Austria, the, the queen of, of France, so that, uh, with her fleur de lis uh, mantle, that hold the painting in front of an Indian on his knees. Uh, and in the painting, you will have a uh, subject matter that is repeated the same in heaven, in, in, in the sky. Uh, and, uh, of course, the, the, the theme here is, the, the, uh, say, France bringing faith to the Indians. Uh, and in fact, to the Euron. The, uh, if, you, if you read about it a little bit in the literature, it was, for instance, attributed for a while to this Frère Luc, the same that we saw before. But we have discovered since that this painting was ordered by the Jesuit for the Euron. Uh, they wanted to, to, and it's like this, it says, uh, we uh, order a painting from, from Nantes. Uh, it was not done in Canada, it was done in France. And uh, to, in order to show to the Indian how faith was brought to them. Uh, and of course, the Jesuits were using images to preach to the Indian. Uh, they had engravings, they had paintings. 
and uh, sometimes with subject absolutely terrible like uh, hell and, and heaven, you see. So it's very, it's very clear. If you don't convert, you go here in the hell. And if you convert, look, you will be on clouds and things like that. It would be wonderful. And um, so they, they had this method, let's say, that, that I, I wrote a book about this, about the, I call it la conversion par l'image, huh? the conversion by the picture. And uh, this, this is what is depicted there. But what was interesting to me today, you know, it is the representation of the Olé family in this picture. If you take two uh, details of what you just saw, you will see on the left what is shown in the picture that the, the, the France was uh, showing to the Indian. And there you have, I would say, two, uh, two axes. If you go to the vertical axis, you have got the father on the top of the picture, and then the, uh, uh, what the, uh, a victor of my knowledge called La Volaille, this, this was not a nice way to put it, but the column, column, the dove yeah, of the Holy Ghost, and finally, uh, Jesus on a throne. So in this vertical axis, you will have the Trinity, if you want. So the, uh, the God the Father, the, uh, the, the Holy Ghost, and then Jesus. And on horizont horizontally, you will have on one side two women. Okay, this is the Blessed Virgin Mary, and is her mother, Anne. And on the other side, you will have Joseph. Joseph is always with a lily in the hand because he's so nice. He doesn't, he's pure like a lily. <laughs> Habitually also represented quite old, that there will be no doubt on his uh, sideline activities. Okay, well, <laughs> and uh, so he's there with uh, also Joachim of a, a little bit uh, uh, louder. So you have horizontally another holy family, if you want, that include also Jesus, of course, in the center. When you go in the sky now, you have the same personage, but distributed a different, differently. Let's say the Trinity is together in the middle, and then you have the two others. And all suggestion of houses, let's say, for instance, in a painting, you have at least some, uh, a little bit of uh, some stairs, and you have a throne, and maybe pillar in the background. Here in, in heaven, of course, we don't need all this. We don't just need comfortable clouds. Uh, uh, and so they are sitting there. And then I said, my goodness, this is very different from the, uh, what I call the recent, uh, the, the tardif, if you want, uh, iconography that we had before. Before, you could say the Ole family is represented like a model of work. Huh? The, the, the carpenter is working and the, uh, the, the mother is sewing and things. So at least uh, for, uh, if you want to give it as a model to, to, uh, uh, to normal family, well, okay, work hard and you will make a living and things like that. And your son will play with a piece of wood and he will think uh, of his death mode. Anyway, the, the, uh, the, it, it makes sense. But here, to give that as a model of family, it's, it's, uh, it's rather strange. You just have to sit and to contemplate forever the Holy Trinity. Huh? So suddenly there's a kind of passivity was expressed and the, the, uh, the idea of a house or so began to vanish a little bit. Huh? You have a domestic space without the domus, without the house. Huh? Without, and, and, and this, is, uh, the, this uh, uh, is, is interesting because it has to be explored a little bit. Okay, here is an engraving uh, done by a Dutch uh, uh, engraver who's not very well known, Albertus Clouvet, and, uh, but about the, the same period of the time, in which maybe is a source of the painting. Um, well, it's close enough uh, as an idea to think that it's a source. So uh, on the top, you have the same axis uh, of the uh, God the Father with uh, a kind of uh, nymph uh, in form of a triangle because of the Trinity, of course, and then under uh, the Holy Ghost, and finally Jesus on the throne also. And on each side, sitting, you have Mary and Joseph, but standing, you have Anne and, and, and Joachim. And in front, you have two other saints, uh, Saint Ignatius and Saint Francis Xavier, uh, two Jesuit saints. So it gives you right away the source of this type of picture. And it's probably the Jesuit who have created this iconography and then tried to, to, uh, repair, uh, to, to expand it, to disseminate it everywhere. No? And again, if you look at the setting, okay, you have some tiling in the, in the floor. Huh? You have few, uh, few stairs and then the throne, but you have no walls. Huh? You have no roof. Huh? And again, this kind of openness of a, of a non, 
and even this decor is not a decor of a house. Uh, it's a kind of a palace, maybe something mysterious. And, and again, it is this idea of people just sitting there, contemplating, doing absolutely nothing. And, uh, and, uh, and the curious thing, it is that apparently, Monseigneur Laval, by creating this uh, confrérie of uh, the La Sainte Famille, of the Olé family, have also distributed the image a little bit in that style, in which the Olé family was doing nothing, was just passively contemplating the, uh, what, what they have uh, in front of them, the, this kind of uh, apparition of uh, God. And this, this idea of, uh, of uh, contemplation come from, in fact, a very old tradition. I think always, uh, already Gregory the Great have uh, made this distinction about the angels. I say there's two types of angels. There's angels who are ministers, he says. Uh, why? Because they come from heaven to us and they give us some information about what will happen through dreams, and whatever. So there's a, a bunch of angels who are doing that. But he says there's another big number who are just assisting so the, but in the sense, not to assist to a spectacle, but in the sense of to be present and to give glory to God. Huh? So there's two, two categories there. Of, uh, of, uh, and it's not true that angels are eating Philadelphia cheese all the time. Uh, this is not where they were done for. I look for maybe an hour to find this picture. I'm so proud to have it. And then... <laughs> The, the internet, you go, you go, you have Philadelphia. I, I, I saw a, any image of cheese to not even wanting to touch them anymore. For even if you go to hell for, for, for not, to, <laughs> not to see it. Okay, now what the angel do, it is very well expressed here in this uh, uh, extraordinary altarpiece by uh, Jan van Eyck, uh, in which you see on the top part especially, uh, say I will give you a detail, you see the angels are musicians, are there to really, what uh, Gregory the Great called assisting. Huh? They are there to give glory to God by music, uh, singing is uh, praising him endlessly, and doing nothing else, huh? not, not working, not uh, just being l like artists. I, if I go back, you see on each side of God the Father in the middle, you have the Virgin on one side, and you have St. John the Baptist on the other. Uh, St. John the Baptist uh, owned the Bible because uh, he is uh, telling that he, from him uh, what was uh, announced in the Old Testament will be realized now. And the Virgin is with a, a little book of him or something like that on the other side. And then you have further the, uh, the angels that I just present to you. And on each side, of course, Adam and Eve, huh? uh, who do nothing either in this type of uh, presentation. And if you, if you read the, the, the fantastic book that I should recommend to you, uh, I'm sure it's translated already in English, but it's, um, it's done by an uh, Italian philosopher that I like. It's called Giorgio Agamben, uh, A-G-A-M-B-E-N, Agamben. Uh, it's called La Gloire et le Pouvoir, or something like that in French, but uh, Glory and Power, let's say, in English. And he have a chapter on the angels there and it's, the, the subtitle is Angelology, uh, the, the science of angels, and bureaucratia. <laughs> so it, as if, if you transpose this idea of uh, some angel being ministers and other being just for praising the power, if you transpose this in term of, let's say, uh, the king of the time, uh, the, let's say in seventh century, it's uh, Louis XIV. And indeed, the court was organized like that. You had people who were ministering, who were administering, and you had others who were just around the king. They were there when he wake up, they were there when he went to sleep, they were there with him to see if he was laughing at the comedy of Moliere or not, and ch checking on him, and in, in fact doing nothing. Uh, this beautiful bureaucracy was uh, a little bit, say sometimes you ask yourself uh, uh, today even uh, in the parliament, uh, why there's so many functionaires who do absolutely nothing? Well, it's for that. They are assisting the power. They are there to praise the, the, the prime minister. And, and uh, so you, you, see the, you see this kind of division between the two, the two type of angels and the two type of administration. But definitely, in this choice, the Holy Family is represented like 
with the assistant. Uh, they are not there to work. They are not there to, uh, uh, to uh, do things and to be model for us, except a model, I would say, of the liturgy, of uh, 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 what a good family should do will be to praise the Lord also, to be also, in fact, uh, uh, careful with the, the natural power, we'll say with the power of the, uh, uh, the politic power, if you want, will be uh, obedient and everything. But uh, uh, this type of model that was given uh, in this, uh, by Monseigneur Laval uh, right uh, away in the beginning. And I will show you bad reproduction, but in a way it's not very important because these paintings are not very good either. But just to see how it was uh, uh, disseminated, let's say. So for instance, again, a, a holy family with a trinity. Huh? They are just there to look at Jesus, the, the parents, they do nothing. And then Jesus himself looks up toward the Trinity, uh, to, of which he's a part, of course. You have the dove and, and, uh, and the father. Uh. And, and this painting, done, uh, we don't know by whom, who come from France and was given to the uh, Hotel Dieu in Quebec uh, by a father du Plessis, and the, uh, this painting, he says, was inspired by little engravings that Monsignor Laval have created at the time and distributed to the family. So that means this is the image of the Ole family that he wants that the people will have. See? The, not, not the image of working people, but people praising the Lord. Huh? So you see, you, you see the two tradition about the Ole family, and paradoxically, the whole tradition in terms of domesticity is open. Uh, is not, is a little bit like Samuel Bois. <laughs> for what I was presenting before, this kind of uh, open. Uh, and then you have a little shift of the theme uh, that will happen. For instance, again, on the left, uh, another painting that ends up at the Hotel Dieu de Québec, in which you have an impression it's, it's exactly the same theme. You see uh, the Trinity in the sky, and you see uh, Jesus uh, between his parents with a huge lily uh, for uh, uh, Saint Joseph. But this is, a, in fact, a copy of Murillo picture that I show you on the right. Huh? Not a very clever one, but uh, it's evident that the, the painter have, took his inspiration from Murillo. Uh, Murillo is a great painter, Spanish, all that, and make a lot of these uh, religious paintings. But what Murillo is doing, it is representing the Holy Family uh, fleeing to Egypt. Huh? You, you remember this? This passage of the gospel, uh, well, maybe not too many of you read the gospel, but anyway, I, I will read you the, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, uh, younger people. <laughs> uh, it, it's again, the, you would see it's so typical of the, of, uh, for St. Joseph. In, in, the, in the Bible, in, in the gospel, St. Joseph is always dreaming. Huh? When we speak of him, is is. Uh, Sleeping and dreaming. Anyway, so there are another case. He says, after they had left, they is the Magi. See, after the Magi had left, and an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Herod will be looking for the child in order to kill him. So get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you to leave. Joseph got up took the child and his mother, and left during the night for Egypt, where he stayed until Herod died. This was done to make come true uh, that the Lord had said through the prophet, I call my son out of Egypt. Okay. So this is the, the, the part of the gospel that Murillo wanted to illustrate, the family fleeing from uh, Israel, going to Egypt in order to be protected. But then the relationship between uh, the Holy Family and the Trinity is different. Then they are protected by the, uh, by the Holy Trinity. Huh? They, are, they, are, they are not assisting to it. They are, in fact, in, in terms of uh, going out. And indeed, with time, the apparition in the heaven will disappear. We will just show the Holy uh, Family as such, like walking toward uh, a more quiet place. Huh? And it is um, Ozias Le Duc that uh, rediscovered this theme in later, uh, not when he was uh, working in Joliet, but he made a, this sketch, who is now at the Mekor Museum, of the Ole family, like traditionally should be represented, without houses, 
and in a church probably because you see the baluster in the, in the front and you see people kneeling in front of it. So really we return to this liturgical uh, type of uh, presentation. Okay, my, my sermon is over, I finish. Uh, <laughs> with religious stuff, like Tom Waits says, okay, let's, let's shift with something else. Okay, the, let, let's deal now with the domestic space as it was represented by painter of the, uh, of uh, closer to us, let's say, in term of time. I didn't put the date here, but it's a, it's a picture of 1936 huh? uh, by Kathleen Daly. It's not a very well-known uh, painter but uh, for instance, you should know that she wrote a nice little book about James Wilson Maurice. Huh? And she was the wife of uh, Pepper, of another Pepper, not the one <laughs> who is dealing with ghosts that I was presenting before, but John Pepper who was uh, a Canadian painter also of some merit. Huh? And they used to go, both of them, to the region of Charlevoix in Quebec. Huh? And they were very interested by uh, this kind of uh, surrounding. And what, what is typical of uh, Kathleen Daly, that she was able to get in in these houses, very poor people, uh, that in, in most of the time, let's see people like Clarence Gagnon or uh, Jackson or Lisber was presenting from outside. See, they were not really getting in like this. And so, so she, she suddenly represents a kind of very poor type of surrounding in which you have this huge stove and uh, the house is, is, uh, is warmed by, by the system. On the wall, you have this big black cross uh, that, ça c'est la, la croix de la tempérance. Uh, they, these are good people. Yeah, no alcohol. Uh, they, they are uh, part of the Lacordaire and the uh, Jeanne d'Arc and all these uh, organizations in which you, you don't drink. So they have this black cross on the wall. And then the only picture who are there, in fact, are religious picture uh, that you can see. And you have old Mrs. Bradette in front, uh, in the foreground, in front of an empty chair, of course, that represents probably her husband who died. And then in the back, a mother with another child. Huh? So it's a completely feminine type of surrounding. Huh? Domesticity goes with privacy and goes with feminine values. Huh? This is, of course, a stereotype because it's opposed to the public space where the boys are triumphant. Huh? And so you put the, the, the woman in the domestic space, very well closed, no windows again, and uh, doing nothing, sitting, and, uh, and uh, when the boys are outside uh, speaking uh, politics and everything, much more interesting, huh? and you know. <laughs> anyway, the, so this is kind of peasant uh, domesticity represented here, and you will see most, almost the same type of pattern also when they, they show you a more bourgeois type uh, of houses, uh, in which, for instance, the, this painting of Breimner, who a young lady uh, making what we call the uh, crazy quilt, uh, the, this type of pattern. I'll show you one example on, on the right, uh, where uh, instead of following very geometrical type of presentation, like it's normal in a quilt, they will assemble any piece of... Uh, of uh, but here again, the prevalence of this religious old iconography that I was showing you before reappear here. Huh? Because you remember the vision was presented as suing. Huh? And here again you have this uh, activity associated with women uh, in the interior. Huh? If you go a little bit further, you will see for instance interior as the background of the representation of a kind of an intellectual. Let's see here, he's with a book and he have a library uh, behind him. And uh, this man, Jean Chauvin, uh, was indeed a, a journalist and a writer. He was involved also even in the administration of this museum for a while. And uh, he was also the head of a magazine, it was called La Revue Populaire, right, in which uh, they, they opened their, their magazine to art and things. And uh, he was a good friend of Old Gate because they lived together in Morin Nights, uh, very close one to the other. So he knew well Monsieur Chauvin. And uh, he, he, he presented him here like absorbed in his reading, but lifting his eyes toward us, but still in the, in, the, in the content of the book, I would say. I'm not very present to ourselves. And the, the, the model of this type of presentation, let's say, you could make a kind of reference, for instance, to 
uh, Edouard Manet representation of Zola, uh, in which, again, you have uh, a man sitting with a book in his hand. But of course, Ma uh, Zola, there is a, a different type of setting, especially that Manet have put his own Olympia in, in the top there. Huh? You recognize it? And if you look carefully at the eyes of this Olympia, she's looking at Zola. Huh? Just, uh, that is fantastic to be able, just with two little dots, to give the impression that she's looking at Zola instead of, uh, normally, Le Olympia looks to nobody, and she's uh, looking in front uh, uh, of her, and she's not uh, represented. So that could be a model. The, the Edgar Degas, the portrait de, de Duranti, is a, also a good possible reference, because, again, you have uh, this man immersed in his book and his papers around him, putting uh, two fingers to his uh, uh, side of the head like this to, to, to show that he's thinking. And, uh, but uh, what uh, Rosalind Peppel suggested when we published the catalog on Old Gate, huh, and this, uh, you remember we had a show on Old Gate here, it was a reference with Cezanne. And I think she's right. This is uh, the best uh, uh, correspondence like, that you can make, you see, between the two paintings. Cézanne made a portrait here of Gustave Geoffroy. Geoffroy was a, a, a critic, a journalist also, and, and wrote a, a little piece about Cézanne. And Cézanne was very touched by that. He told him, uh, see, in a letter, he says, yesterday I read the long study that you devoted to eliminating the attempts of a made in painting. Now, this is typical Cézanne. Les efforts que j'ai fait en peinture, c'est as if <laughs> what he did was just his effort. Uh, I wanted to express my gratitude and invite him to make his portrait, okay? So Geoffroy come, and he said, okay, installez-vous là, the, the place yourself there with books and things, and uh, Cézanne start. But, but you know, Cézanne was, uh, of course, speaking with a model all the time, see, because, uh, and he had many, many uh, uh, séances de pose, comme ça, one after the other. And, uh, and Geoffroy uh, revealed himself like a, a complete idiot. I think he, he was terrible. He was making stupid jokes and, uh, and everything. And more and more he went, uh, Cezanne could not bear him anymore. He said he wanted to, allow. so he never finished the painting. You know, if you look at the hands, they are unfinished. And he gave him a kind of a weird look. He seems <laughs> rather dangerous <laughs> instead of, uh, of being just uh, somebody there. And I have a nice description, he said, uh, done by a critic, he said, as a result, the sitter come across as an opaque and mysterious presence, powerful, even a bit menacing. In all likelihood, this was indeed how the skittish Cezanne perceived Geoffroy. The incompletion, however, had a singular grandeur to the image, the product of an odd coupling, coupling of psychological indifference and formal intelligence. That's well said. So. And, uh, so you could say that in the case of uh, Olgate, of course, this, is a, this, this uh, hatred uh, didn't play because they were friends, Chauvin and, and Olgate. But uh, uh, certainly, he had this reminiscence of this Cezanne you know, he, when he presented uh, his, uh, his friend. Huh? Olgate did also uh, a portrait of a, of a woman playing a cellist, let's say, in the same spirit, if you want, see somebody also that he knew. Uh, a, a lady was called Yvette Lamontagne, and she was a teacher at Vincent Indy uh, in music and also at McGill. And uh, she was a, a good uh, cellist, uh, having a concert, uh, uh, playing in concert, but also teaching. Uh. And I put the painting of Holgate in parallel with this um, rather unknown uh, American painter called Joseph de Caen, and with a cellist in which you see all it's very romantic and very. Uh, the type of painting that was called tonalist because the importance was given to tone and uh, to the variation inside of one color. For instance, the brown there will be the main color and then you could uh, create lots. Olgate is much more rough than that. Uh, you present the, the, the personage in a kind of close surrounding with a painting on a wall, a carpet, and all the, the, the furniture that she needs to play on uh, a chair and, and this uh, partition holder in, in front. And that's it. So you have a very terse type of presentation and much stronger, of course, than the American one. Sometimes it's good to, to put them in parallel to, uh, uh, to see that our painter is not so bad, <laughs> that we have also good one. Uh, 
again, going uh, always in the same direction with, uh, with our Canadian inventor, with John Lyman. He called this one the serial. Okay, it's uh, the depiction, let's say, of a mother uh, reading a, a kind of uh, a novel or something to his uh, uh, boy. And in fact, the painting is organized around an axis that is marked by this lamp that you see in, in the background. Huh? The lamp is like a vertical in which everything in the room there circulates. Huh? The lighting doesn't come nor from the window, uh, which have a curtain, nor from the lamp. But uh, if you look carefully, the, the, the part of the body who are illuminated seems to come from the left. Huh? And uh, something that we don't know, maybe an opening there. And then you have this kind of close circulation between the personage who is uh, very uh, well constructed. Lyman is, is a painter that uh, the, was not uh, enthusiastic, it's less I can do, about abstraction. But in fact, he, he always treat, uh, uh, let's say, a figurative painting almost like an abstraction, like a construction, very, very thought and very well organized, huh? like here. Also, notice that the recurrence of a religious theme here. The idea of the virgin teaching uh, to, to her son how to read, for instance. Uh, or even Saint Anne teaching the virgin how to read. Uh, this is a theme that you saw also always uh, in, in Quebec. As if the, this theme of the bourgeois family or whatever that was treated by our painter are a little bit enclosed in this limit already put by uh, the religious painter of before. Yeah. Another example of Lyman uh, achievement, it is these card games in which you see two ladies concentrating on their cards and then having this uh, oil lamp, very prominent. And it's, of course, because the, the glass are completely black, we are in the middle of the night. It's this lamp that project this kind of weird shadows that you have on the wall there. And I don't know if you can see it, but we see a reflection of the lamp in one of the window there. Very pale, but uh, a little bit there. Uh, in some of the drawing, it's clearer. Uh, this is preparatory drawing to this painting in which you see a little bit more this reflection. And uh, there, I think what, what Lyman wanted to do, it is a kind of uh, transposition of a painter of the past that he admired a lot. And this painter was Georges de Latour. Uh, and Latour, you know, is a painter who have always tried to create an atmosphere like this around maybe one candle or one little source of light in which you see everything there will be illuminated by that. I read you just a little passage of Lyman about Latour and you will see the, his enthusiasm. He say, he never portrayed the picturesque evidence of emotion. He imbues the object with his own emotion. Rarely have intensity of feeling and intellectual lucidity been so perfectly integrated. Density of form answered to sure and strict composition. He has a burning passion for object to penetrate its superficial emblems and reconstitute it with all the purity of geometric volume. All this that is said about Latour could be applied to Lyman himself. Uh, this is really his world. This is, uh, and uh, in part of his journal, the journal of Lyman is extraordinary because it's written in perfect French and in perfect English. He shifts from one language to the other. His wife was French Canadian, you know, Corinne Saint Pierre, and uh, Lyman was perfectly bilingual. And even in his uh, private diary, he goes like this from French to English, and uh, so he, he, he speaks in, I think, quite late in 1956, uh, the, uh, a visit he made at the Frick Collection in New York. I don't know if you have seen the Frick Collection. It's an extraordinary uh, place. Huh? It's like, uh, it looks like a private home of uh, somebody uh, with some money, but, uh, uh, and then on the wall, you have all masterpiece. Saw the Frick for the first time, the great revelation, Georges de Latour, education of the Virgin. So again, this theme that come back. Uh, oh, what a lovely, perfect thing. Too lovely to talk about. De Latour, the faraway ancestor of Balthus. Well, I'm not sure of that, but the, the, uh, the, uh, the enthusiasm for Latour uh, at Lyman is very clear. And the painting he mentioned is this one. This is in the Frick collection. Uh, we think today, we as an art historian that are always uh, creating trouble for nothing, we think that it's not a genuine Latour. It's a copy. It's a, 
Uh, or, you know, his son, the son of Latour, became a painter and imitated the work of his father. So it could be the son who could be any, anybody else. Or Latour himself was making many copies of the same picture. See? So uh, because they have one in the Louvre, exactly similar to that, they have another one in another museum, there are four of them. Huh? So the Frick is probably not uh, an authentic Latour, but nevertheless, it, it gave exactly the, the type of painting that uh, uh, Lyman was speaking about. And you s uh, so we don't know, th the theme could be the Virgin M Mary, because she's ra relatively young there, teaching to her son how to read. Huh? And uh, like in the, a little bit the same situation like we had in, in Lyman the serial, huh? a mother and a boy, uh, in, uh, where the mother is in the occupation of uh, teaching how to read or, or reading him a, a, a story. Huh? You see, the, again, uh, wh what I speak uh, before uh, of this modeling. Okay. The other thing also that Latour is famous for, it is card players. Huh? And so, it, uh, again, it's a team that you could have, uh, could have some connection with, with the interests of Lyman with card games huh, that we saw before. But here it's a, it's a complex picture because you, you have... Uh, an idiot no, on the right, a young tête de linotte, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, but bird, bird brain maybe or something, that thinks that he could fool everybody, but he is in the hand of very, very sharp people. One with the, uh, have already a winning card in his uh, belt and show, us to, uh, show to us. And that the two ladies uh, bringing wine for these kids in order to make him a little bit more fuzzy. And uh, so, and, and, and if you look at all the, the intricacy of looks and, and, uh, and feelings in this picture, is amazing. So all the, each one looks in different direction. Each one is, is watching what can happen. And the only who doesn't realize what's happening, it is a boy who will be, uh, uh, let's say, délesté uh, of his money. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the, this theme of interior in, in Lyman, is, is, uh, you have many examples. This is another one that he called Dream. Uh, the, Sometimes it's called Breakfast also, uh, the same painting, because it's what we see. You see, we are still early in the morning, if you look by the window. And this woman has this gesture who's habitually associated with melancholia uh, in the tradition. When you have somebody like this, like in the famous Durer, engravings of uh, melancholia. You remember, the, you have an angel like this that all her hand. So this, this theme uh, could be, the reverie could be not completely positive. But any, anyway, this I think uh, show you well what the, the, the kind of potentiality of this theme of domesticity huh? and how it have deep religious uh, uh, tradition behind. But if we go further, if we try to get to the private sphere, not to the domestic sphere, but really to the private world, and especially if there is some sexual dimension to that, then you are in a very different tradition, that you are something that looks more weird. For instance, Oldgate, I've made for me one of the most troubling pictures <laughs> that you could imagine. You see a little girl's coming, all dressed, to his mother who's naked li like uh, when she was born, having uh, nonchalantly a book uh, to read in this apparel. And the little girl doesn't seem to, uh, to shock. And they say, uh, say uh, in Hebrew, and uh, everything is okay, there, there's no problem. And, the, uh, and then this is, okay, the entrance in the intimate world uh, and the privacy. Uh, this is different than what we saw before. Before you have this kind of religious model, mind you here, you could see the mother reading to a child is also a kind of religious theme, but because of nudity, it, it, it's, uh, it's completely uh, impossible to integrate to that level. Huh? Uh, the, habitually, the, uh, this idea of uh, mother reading to their child or woman naked reading it's a rare theme, in fact, uh, in art history. You don't find it often. Well, I, do, I give you two examples. I, on the side, it's a German painter. It's called uh, uh, Anton Heber, and, uh, in which you see uh, everybody's dressed properly and in bed, and uh, the mother is reading a serial also to the little kid. Mind you, there's a, the other kid on the left seems interested by something else than the reading, but anyway. And, uh, 
And in the other, Theodore Roussel is a, a French uh, uh, a man born in France, but living in England for, for most of his career. And he have represented uh, his model who got bored uh, in a seance and decided to read like this. It's a big painting, this one. It's a big size painting. When he was presented, of course, it was very shocking. They thought he was a, she was a prostitute and things. And, and you, you see this idea of uh, painting a lady reading uh, or naked or uh, with, with child and all this is a kind of rare theme that, uh, in fact, uh, Old Gate have, uh, have created, uh, say, have created a kind of an example of that by himself. Huh? We cannot also deal with this privacy sphere without evoking some picture of Colville. Uh, uh, woman in bathtub is really uh, uh, strange again uh, in that sense because you have a man behind her uh, who is Colville himself in fact that is looking at you and you are in front of the picture in a kind of voyeuristic type of situation uh, because you see what even her husband doesn't see. Uh, because uh, she's in front of you like this. And the, the proximity that he creates is a little bit like my example of the beginning of the, this ghost, uh, this kind of intrusion in the very private sphere uh, of, uh, let's see, a bathtub. And, and, and he have uh, done many sketches to prepare the, this famous painting. And when you look at the sketches of uh, Colville, it's always amazing because it's full of uh, mathematics and uh, kind of lines and, uh, and uh, he seems to, to enjoy this tremendously, but nobody understands exactly well what, it, uh, uh, what is the role of this in the finished painting. But anyway, he play with this all the time. You, you see that he, he have uh, explored few poses possible and he retained finally one. In the, uh, in the beautiful film that you have must have seen this year at, at, uh, at FIFA on Colville, you have Madame uh, Colville, who is, uh, who is the one, of course, who is in the bathtub, have said that uh, our friends ha had to be very tolerant to, uh, to, uh, to be able to look at this picture. And they tease Colville to say, okay, you show a naked woman like this in front, but you will not dare to do it with men. So he says, okay. And it is this one that he called the refrigerator. Yeah? And, uh, I'm sure you have not seen that there's three cats there. Huh? Yes, yes. <laughs> we are attracted by something else there. But anyway, and, and this is obviously a, a scene that every couple have lived after making love. You know, you, you suddenly have a urge to, to drink milk or whatever. And, uh, and uh, you go to the fridge in, the, in this uh, light uh, clothing. And, 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 uh, and again, you see, it's a, you see that it's not the domestic, it's a domestic space, but this is a, a private space huh, in which normally we are not, uh, we are not going to, to be uh, accepted or to be introduced to. Huh? And uh, I think one of the most fantastic picture, I will finish with that, of Colville on, the, on this theme is this following, is this one. It's one June noon, okay. You see him outside of the tent with binoculars, looking at the ocean uh, far, and you have this naked lady inside of the tent, and where you are exactly, you are in the tent also, you as a spectator. Again, Colville defined your position of spectator as a voyeuristic type of position. Right? You, are, you are in a kind of an impossible place, as if this enclosure is completely open, in fact. Huh? From our side, it must be open somewhere, otherwise we will not see anything of that. Huh? And uh, so again, I would say you have a definition of privacy here by the negation, uh, a little bit like my first example of the ghost of uh, Daniel Olson and the ghetto of Samuel Boisbois, in which they get you understand what is a private uh, space, but by uh, defining, defining it negatively. Uh, oof, I don't know if I convinced you of that, but. This is what I wanted to, to say. Okay, next time we will deal with uh, the communal uh, space, I call it. That means it's a little bit like the family space, but bigger. 
uh, let's say for a full group or for uh, even a nation could have a communal space. And so we'll do that uh, next time. Thank you.